Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is the first of our webinar series on the future of work, and we're calling this one Re-Entry Without Burning Up, uh, which is really designed to kick us off and talk about what it's going to be like as the world slowly returns to something resembling normal. Um, so that's where we're going. My name is Wayne Turmel. Most of you are familiar with me, at least as the co-author of The Long Distance Leader and The Long Distance Teammate. I am doing the first two webinars in this series. Kevin uh, will be doing the next two. And then the last one we'll be doing together. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I have been in this game about 28 years from day one managing remote teams or hybrid teams. Some people remote, some people co-located. And I currently live in Las Vegas, although world headquarters for Remote Leadership Institute and the Kevin Eikenberry Group is Indianapolis. So we are living this every day just as you are. Uh, here's what we're gonna cover in our time together. Uh, as glad as we are, that we are seeing light at the end of the COVID tunnel, the return to work is gonna be tricky. And, and I wanna talk about why that's going to be. And as you're thinking about what should your workplace look like, we're gonna look at three factors, physical factors, social factors, and creating, intentionally creating a company culture. And then we're gonna give you some questions to ask yourself about your own readiness to return to work and your team. So that's what we're going to cover in the next 23 minutes. So there you have it. A few weeks ago, I was talking to somebody and we kept jokingly using the term re-entry. And it occurred to me that as a child of the space age, there are two times in a space journey when you are at risk. One is during takeoff, the other one is during re-entry. While you're out in space, generally speaking, you're pretty safe. And as we kept talking about re-entry, I was making the joke, I hope we don't burn up on re-entry. And then I thought that's really not that funny because <laughs> that is the most dangerous time. And why is it dangerous? Well, the problem is friction. When spaceships return through the Earth's uh, atmosphere, it creates friction, which creates heat, which can make very bad things happen. And I thought, well, what is the friction? It's not the actual atmosphere uh, that's going to make re-entry tricky. And I came up with some friction points. And if you can think of some that aren't on this list, by all means, but it starts with the fact that not everybody wants to go back, uh, at least right now. And, and this is for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that people have various levels of comfort with where we are in terms of the obvious things, the pandemic and, and the safety of doing that. Some people are ready to return, some people are not. Uh, that is not a judgment. We all have our reasons, it's just a thing. Uh, the other thing that not everybody wants to be back is we have learned that a lot of people can make working from home work and the idea of facing that commute every day again doesn't really have the appeal it once had. Uh, at the very least, people are going to have to adjust their routines. For the last year, they've been dealing with their kids and the dog and the spouse and all of that in a certain way. And now we're going to have to readjust our routines yet again. One of the causes of friction is that there are going to be more hybrid arrangements. Uh, many organizations were, you should go into the office. And then some had people working remotely full time and that was already part of the culture. But in going back, the one thing that we know from our clients and, and from people we're talking to is that no two organizations are gonna be exactly the same. Uh, a lot of people are going to be going to a more flexible arrangement 
where they may be home more than they're in the office, they may be in the office more than they're home, or it might be a predefined number of days. Every organization is going to be different and your mileage may vary. Uh, over the last year, teams have new members. Uh, some teams have been disbanded and reorganized. And so, whereas before the pandemic, uh, you know, the team existed in whatever form it existed and people kind of had their relationships and their arrangements, but there are now new people, you're working with people you weren't before, this causes friction. It's not necessarily bad, it's just friction. Uh, not all questions will be answered right away. People are looking for something sure and they're looking for confidence and they're looking for leadership. And oh, by the way, <laughs> they want somebody to sound like they have actual answers and we may not have all the answers. And another reason that there's going to be friction is because it involves change and change always involves friction. Uh, you know, one of the things Marlene said in the chat is fears of micromanagement. And a lot of people have experienced kind of freedom from micromanagement because you can't manage somebody, micromanage them at a distance. Uh, even if you want to, it's not physically possible. Now you might be in the same space as your boss and that might happen. Uh, so that's why we think that there will be challenges. And like I say, if you have other ones that we haven't mentioned, by all means, get them in the chat. We want this to be pretty informal. Uh, but in talking about this, we've kind of identified three success factors that might make it easier. Um, you know, Julia says, uh, you know, in order to kind of track people's work, there's been a lot more documentation and task logs. And at the office, you're kind of more free. And that makes sense because you're in line of sight. We can see, oh, Julia's here and she's working, so we're not worried about it, right? It's going to depend on the organization that you're in. The three success factors that were dealing with are navigating physical and logistical changes. And this actually speaks to something Pamela just sent me in the chat. So we'll address that in a moment. Uh, there are social factors at work involving, you know, human beings and creating the company culture that you want. Your company has a culture and it is creating a culture. The only question is, are you doing it on purpose or kind of letting it go? So let's start by talking about physical and logistical changes. And Pamela said something. She said, we're moving buildings in the middle of all this and there will be fewer cubes and offices. And that's exactly right. Uh, a lot of things have changed. Uh, the running joke around here is the two businesses you don't want to be in as a result of the pandemic is corporate real estate and dry cleaning uh, because things are changing. Uh, we have a client that Kevin works with who is moving from three buildings to one because they're going to be doing more hybrid things. Uh, the things that are going to dictate the changes are very real. Now, sometimes they are outside our control. Uh, depending on which country you're in, which jurisdiction you're in, which state you're in, the regulations may be outside your control. Uh, some places are going to require masks for a while yet. Others are going to ask for proof of vaccination or, uh, and others are just going to throw the doors open and say, go back to work. You may or may not have control over that. Uh, Many organizations are changing their office hours or moving to shift work to allow people to come back to the office, but not have as many people in the office at a given time for safety reasons, as well as we're doing things like covering time zones and doing those kinds of things, making sure that people are available to their teammates. 
Now, what's interesting is we're hearing a lot of organizations are moving to more flexible arrangements. Well, since more people will be working from home and we don't need everybody in the office at the same time, we don't need as many desks, which sounds like a good thing, but people are gonna come back and find that they are now living in cubes that they weren't before, or that they no longer have their desk because they're in a hoteling situation. And if you have never thought that people losing their desk space or having to share a desk would be a big deal, walk into church and tell somebody they have to sit in a different pew than they've been sitting in for years. You know, it's really interesting, uh, you know, and is it their desk to start with, right? That's the thing. People are territorial. This is going to cause some drama. It is just going to cause friction, right? If you are going to create a balance of in-office and flexible work, we're finding out that we can do that. But how do we do it so that people are available to customers at a certain time, that people are carrying their share of the customer service and team support load. Um, all of those things are going to need to be negotiated. And one thing I'm sure we can agree on is that people will be absolutely logical and reasonable through all of this. And I'm joking partly because I'm a cynic with uh, uh, a fair amount of skepticism about human behavior to start with, but more importantly, people are people and we can't expect them to respond in ways that go against our nature. So these physical and logistical changes are going to have to be worked out. There are also going to be some serious social challenges. And if you look in the chat, we're already seeing some of this, right? Where you've got the introverts and the extroverts and the extroverts are going crazy, waiting for human contact till they can be with other people. And the introverts are like, you know what? I like being left alone. And the idea of going back and dealing with all that doesn't really appeal to me. Uh, that's going to be something that we have to deal with. Um, the whole idea of introverts and extroverts and making sure that people are connected and not overly connected and feeling hard done by, we've kind of been allowed to self-select over the last year. You know, those who are really introverted and don't want to be interrupted or interact any more than necessary have kind of been able to do that. At least in the old days, you know, introverts had human contact thrust upon them and the extroverts had to occasionally be kept under control. Uh, one of the things, and my sister reminded me, this is a very big thing at work, is people have been in media and social bubbles where they haven't had to interact with uh, other people who maybe they don't agree with or get along with. If I don't particularly like Bob from accounting, I've just minimized my interaction with him, but I can't do that. You know, if you've spent an entire year just consuming one form of media and dealing with the same people and avoiding others, and now you're being thrown back together, that may create some problems. Uh, new alliances have formed, and we're going to talk about this in a moment. When we work remotely, we choose who and when we communicate with and one of the things that has happened, and research has borne this out, Harvard Business Review and others, is that teams that were together and co-located and had really strong relationships have generally maintained those relationships during COVID. We've been managed to hold it together, but where the relationships weren't real strong or where we've had new people brought onto the team or the teams have been reorganized, people have 
formed their little alliances. And we often don't know what those are exactly, because if you're excluded, it's kind of hard to know that's the case. And not only have people been forming their own relationships and all of that, they've also created their own habits. And I'm just talking about things as simple as wearing pants and grown-up clothes. And, you know, what's it going to be like? Are we going to have a dress code? Are there going to be expectations about what people wear around the office? Those kinds of things, you know, people have found, hey, I've been able to get work done in my ACDC t-shirt. Why do I need to dress for the office? And if you don't think that's going to be a challenge, I suspect that you are a optimist. Um, and new members need to be integrated. And when we were in the office 100% of the time, that happened both relatively quickly and organically. Uh, what are you going to do? How are you going to form a real team when some people are there all the time and the newbies will be interacting with them and others will not? And what do you do when the newbies aren't there? When the newbies are the ones who are working from home. So those are challenges that we're going to be dealing with. And then finally creating or rebuilding a corporate culture. And culture, some of you have heard me say this for years, Culture is just a fancy HR consultancy word for this is how we do things here. There is a way that we work here. There's a way that things get done. When you have a problem, this is how we handle it. And knowing how things work here when you're not here can be a challenge. Uh, we need to figure out now that we know that most people can work from home, we have to answer the question of should. Whose work really needs to be co-located? Who can work remotely? Who should work remotely? And who has sufficient flexibility to do all of that? And some of that is answering the question, when does being together matter? When do we need to have people together? And this becomes a really interesting question on the logistics side. Good news is we're only going to have half as many people in the office, so we only need half as many, half as much floor space. Except Wednesday, we're having an all hands meeting and everybody needs to come in. So we now have half the space and all of the people. Those kinds of things are going to be tricky to navigate for a while. Uh, the other thing that has become a very real issue, and, and during the pandemic, some teams have done a superb job of collaborating and encouraging that kind of brain sharing behavior, and others have not. Some have said, nope, our people work way better when they're together, or, you know, we can do certain things asynchronously through technology, but we want a meeting to actually achieve things. And meetings are not by definition evil when done correctly and for the right reason, they're important. And as the leader of the team, if you've got some people in the office and some people not, how will you equitably communicate? There's some really interesting things that have been going on uh, before the pandemic and we wrote about this a lot at Remote Leadership Institute, and it was an important part of our remote teams class. There's something I call the mom likes you best syndrome, where the people in the office are insanely jealous of the people who work remotely because they don't have to fight traffic and they don't have to wear shirts with buttons and they don't get the dirty jobs that the manager gives to the people who are in the office and they get left alone to do their work. And they don't get told, oh, there's cake in the break room and you got to go because it's Alice's birthday and I don't particularly like Alice, but I have no choice. And the people who work remotely are convinced that the suck ups at the office have it made. They're under the boss's nose. They have access to other team members and the boss anytime they want. They get the good assignments and the plum rolls. They're first in line for promotion and reward and recognition. And that has already existed to some degree. 
uh, like as Keith says, like we needed something else to divide us. Here's the good news is that because so many people have worked remotely now, everybody's kind of experienced it. And I can't tell you how many managers I've talked to who've said, you know, who have always been kind of office based and they go, oh, I get it now. Right. I understand why people are uh, perhaps needy or feel like they're not being communicated with or get frustrated. As leaders, as organizations, we need to think about how do we avoid the mom likes you best thing. And that means thinking about teams less based on location. As we said in long distance leader, think location first or leadership first, location second some things we need to take into account. If we're gonna build a team that may have people anywhere, anytime, equal access does not mean the same. You know, to say, uh, I'm gonna have a meeting with each of you once a week and that's your time is great, but the people in the office can catch you at the coffee pot or bang on your door how are you going to give those who are remote the same access, even though it's not going to be exactly identical, right? Are we creating opportunities for those who work anywhere? Are we making sure that people are uh, getting the assignments and working on projects and interacting with their teammates? And that means we need to think before delegating. It's very easy when we're delegating to go to the first person that we physically see. Now we're going to think about if we're going to delegate this task, maybe I want one person in the office and one person who's remote. Uh, so there's an option, but it's going to need to be more mindful. Uh, we need to share successes, failures, and information in lots of ways and ways that people have access to asynchronously. You know, if I miss a meeting, do I know how Bob is doing on that project? Uh, using asynchronous tools is going to be more important even for those who work in the office. Uh, critical information is going to need to be delivered as equitably as possible. And I'll give you a really common source of frustration for hybrid teams. Uh, something needs to be said. So you walk out to the bullpen. Okay, everybody gather up, listen up. I need to tell you something. And then you go back to your office and you create the email or you schedule a conference call for the people who are remote. And by the time they get the information, the Jungle Telegraph has already done its job. And so it creates this notion of being second-class citizens. And that includes things like we've got pizza in the office and we're going to uh, bring in lunch on Tuesday. And what does that mean when we are actually excluding other people? So we said that we were gonna give you some questions to ask yourself and then questions to ask your folks. And you can get your questions in queue. I've seen some really good, uh, I've seen some good comments in the chat uh, and I'll refer to those, uh, but also get your questions in queue. We'll have a couple of minutes left. Questions to ask yourself. What are your biggest concerns about going back to the environment? What bothers you personally? And what do you think they're gonna be worried about, right? What are you thinking about? Maybe you're not that happy about going back or maybe you're dying to go back and you're concerned that other people aren't. Part of what you need to do is you need to figure out what's changed that is non-negotiable, right? We have less floor space than we had a year ago. Uh, we are moving to hoteling desks and we're not being given a choice in that. Okay, how do we do that? Uh, what worked about the way that it was, right? What made your team special? These are the culture questions. What did you do that worked? 
and how do we maintain that going forward? And here's an equally important question. What wasn't working? It's not like the before time was some halcyon fabulous place where nobody ever had a complaint. Uh, as Tom says, you know, the big concern that it'll be business as usual and it won't. People's habits have changed, circumstances have changed, the way our clients work has changed. This is a time to be very mindful about what wasn't working and how can we address that. And uh, Andrea has a concern. Andrea, I'm going to ask you to hold on to that question and maybe use your mic in a moment in about two more slides. So these are some questions to ask your folks, right? What has changed in their life and circumstances? Some people have not been terribly impacted by COVID and it's all been a huge hoax and an inconvenience and it's all nonsense. Others have lost family members or maybe been sick themselves. Uh, life changes, you know, my wife's sister recently passed away. It had nothing to do with COVID, but it's impacting my wife, right? As a result of the things that have changed, maybe kids have moved back into the house. So now they no longer have the house to themselves like they did before and their workspace isn't as sacred as it was. Uh, what will need to change as a result? You know, we need to ask people, how do they envision their work? Hey, you know, if we come back and this is all perfect, what does it look like? Or, you know, what is the balance of remote and in-office work? Find out what they're thinking before we start imposing things on them. Uh, have their goals changed? A lot of people have done some introspection this year. Maybe what they thought they wanted to do or what they thought their path was uh, a year ago is different than it was now. And what are their concerns about returning to the office? Okay, those are the things we said we were going to talk about. And I know that we're not solving a whole lot here. There's going to be four other webinars uh, to talk about some of these things. But we wanted to create the context for the discussion. Uh, I'm going to go back to Andrea. Andrea, if you want, you can unmute your microphone. Uh, she said in the chat that her concern is that there's an, an inequity. Frontline has to be on site. And all of a sudden, the managers are the ones who can work from home. You want to tell us a little bit about that, Andrea? Um, yeah, I work at a university, and it's already started that like the faculty's people you know, some of them have to be on, on campus, but a lot of the people in office buildings can be at home. And now we're looking, we're looking for ways to, um, to have hybrid teams, but there's some people that can't. And so there was already an inequity before, but they could sort of work around that. But now it's like this, because people have to be on campus and some people could work from home. Absolutely. And, and I want to just piggyback on something Andrea said, which is, we have to remember it's less than a third of the population that has been able to do this transition to working from home. And they tend to be the very fortunate people who aren't frontline customer facing. Uh, there are entire industries where this wasn't an option. And we need to be very aware that the rest of the world doesn't operate the way we do. So I think that being aware of those potential inequities is a very, very big deal, especially since a lot of managers for the first time have experienced working from home and suddenly they're way more open to it. Uh, David says after a year of successful remote work, providing legitimate reasons other than because the boss prefers it this way or because I said so is I think a very legit question. Um, and it, it's those conversations that we talked about. Are we talking about what's negotiable, what's not? Why, what are the reasons, right? We don't think people are sharing information and brainstorming as well as they did when they were together is a much more 
valid reason than, well, we just want everybody to be able to talk to each other. Uh, Keith says, do you think the pandemic has ampl amplified our already embedded habits? Yes. <laughs> yes, it has. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt of that. And we've created new habits. Uh, you know, some people are dying to go back. Amy says, you know, going back uh, to work will be a positive for her. And I believe that. I think it will for most of us. Here's something, and this is a much larger conversation. Over 60% of our social interaction with other people in a given week happens at or through work. Now, whether that's healthy, whether that's the way it should be, it remains a fact. And one of the things that was not as expected and yet became very true is that isolation is a huge issue. A lot of organizations spend a lot of time worrying about the people with kids and spouses and sharing space, but they didn't think too much about the people who were already living on their own or without a lot of social interaction. Uh, so I'm looking at Elizabeth's comment here. Uh, right now, the timelines are getting pushed back and call center folks, some are being told you have to go back to the call center. Some organizations have decided to go primarily virtual. Uh, but call center is an example where you learn as much by sitting next to somebody as you do just reading the screen and doing your job. So these are important conversations. Are there other questions, comments, vicious personal attacks? Uh, I know somebody had asked me, Elizabeth had asked if I could go back to uh, the previous slide. I hope this is the right one. We are at the end of our time. What questions do you have before I release you into the wild? And yes, you will get the recording and the slides in an email probably tomorrow. All right, that's it then. A uh, couple of things. As we're thinking about how do we do this, how do we develop our people, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. The first is that we have a platform called 12 Weeks to Being a Great Remote Teammate. It's 12 weeks of content. You can do it a little bit of content at a time for 12 weeks, or what we call the binge watch version, where you can get everything all at once. And if you want your group to go through it together, we also have the option to do live facilitation. So feel free to reach out to us about that. If you want to talk about anything that we have discussed, uh, you can set up a free half hour consult with me. You can email me, you can reach me through LinkedIn, or you can use the Once Hub uh, link on this. When you get the slides, the links will be live. You can just do that and get on my calendar directly. Uh, we are going to do another uh, session, one on rebuilding and reconstructing rem uh, hybrid teams. We're going to do that on Friday. I am Thursday. I am your humble servant for that one as well. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, you can call me directly. You can just reach the Kevin Eikenberry group and they'll find us. Lots of content on RLI.com as well as YouTube and Twitter. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Thank you so much for your time. 